Welcome to Keep Alive. I'm your host, William Lee, podcaster, podcast producer, and the founder of the Kiva Agency for Digital Marketing. You know, it's been several months now that we have been working on a complete new series called Angie on the Road to Recovery. And today will be the first installment of this great new documentary that we're working on for our listening audience. We wanted to take the time to start a conversation about sex trafficking, abuse, and how so many kids today are in an abusive situation that needs to be talked about. But first we needed to find someone who unfortunately had lived through that life that had a message, one that from their heart wanted to be told so that others could understand that there is love and hope if you only look for it. Our series is being done with Angie, who will introduce herself at the beginning of this conversation. To make sure our guest is comfortable, we have done these podcasts on the telephone. Now, let's start on the road to recovery with Angie. Hi, today on Keep Alive, we've got a very special guest with us today, and this is uh, our guest name is Angie, and Angie, are you there? Yes, I am. Wonderful. I'm glad you called into the show. Today we have a great opportunity to talk to Angie. And uh, what I would like to do, first of all, is have her tell a little bit of the story about yourself. So if you want to go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, So my name is Angie Bagwell. That's my uh, new last name. I'm remarried to my soul twin. That's what I call him. And Uh anyway, so that is... It has been a hard last seven years since I left my first husband. But um, anyway, I thought today what I would talk about is more my personal history. And then, um, you know, we can talk about those, the other history later. But from the beginning, you know. Yeah, Mm -hmm. well, let's start from the beginning with your story. Go ahead, Angie. Okay, so I was born um, to a six year old mother in Morton, Washington. They lived um, nearby, like near Packwood and Glenoma area. And my biological father was 20 at the time I was born, and he is Native American. And I'm thinking that my 16-year-old mother at the time has Native in her, but I just don't know how much, you know. And so, anyway, they... They weren't very prepared to be parents, you know, oh, and okay. um, so the 16-year-old mother, she didn't have her mother. Um, she lost her mother when she was like seven or eight, and so she didn't really have much mothering except from her older sister, and so she she was kind of a wild child, and she was out partying a lot and stuff, and so she left me with various people, you know, just like whoever, and mm-hmm. um the the reason that I was taken by CPS and um at 20 months old was because I was being neglected um I wasn't getting fed you know that kinds of things and so I was really skinny I was like you know like had double ear infections I was a very sickly child and so anyway I went into the CPS system at 20 months old and um I was I most kids in those days would bounce around in the foster care system but I happened to get adopted by the first family that I was placed with and I was placed with a mm-hmm. family that already had a foster child um that child ended up going back to his uh biological mother but I didn't. I they did a termination trial and everything, and and so the adoption was done. They did have to fight because the termination trial you have to kind of fight, you know, um, for sure. to get the parental sure. rights terminated. Oh, so then at 20 months that you are put into this foster care system, and shuffled from there. Is that correct? Yeah, and well, I was placed with a family. Um, that adopted me. Oh, okay. After they went through the parental termination process. So the the way the CPS system works is that if you get, this was back then, so the CPS didn't start until like the late 60s. And so um, 
we're talking like what 74 that I went into the system and um, at that time they they didn't believe in um, I mean they just took kids basically they didn't believe in trying to reunify families really oh so they just basically moved in and for the welfare of the child brought you out into a different system and found you a parent that would take care of you right exactly okay Mm -hmm. what happened from there so from there um i i was uh in the in with that family and my adoptive mom was really good at like taking care of me and um she taught me how to eat properly they let me eat whatever i wanted to because the social worker happened to be a good one you know that was working with the family and saying things like well just let her know she's adopted you know read books to her and um let her eat what she wants to right now and so i ended up like kind of puffing up like a balloon but then um or they called me the pillsbury doughboy or something but then after a while um i thinned out and they took care of all my medical needs and stuff like that um so, um, yeah, so that way they took care of me, but um, the the adoptive father was the one that was the abuser and his dad, and so it was ritual abuse, and lots of times that's like two family members, you know, okay. and so it, it was the, the paternal adoptive grandfather that was abusive, although he was very, uh, he used a lot of hypnosis and mind... I want to call it mind control, but that's what it is. I mean, it's hypnosis. Um, Because at first, I had the instinct. I cried. I didn't like him or anything. But then after a while, I started to like him. I'm sure he probably gave me candy and I, you know, whatever. (laughs) Whatever you do with kids to get them on your side, you know. So as, as time went by then and you grew a little bit older, how did the relationship with the family resolve as you uh, were growing up? Well, um, so so then, like, um, the adoptive father uh, abused me from the beginning, and my first memories are, like, of his erect penis in the bathroom and also his scary mad face. I know that's child language, but um, that's kind of when you're an abuse survivor and you have these memories, I mean, that's, you know, you're kind of stuck or or molded into that child for forever you know what i mean yeah so these these were memories that haunted you as you were growing up is that correct yes and and i was um both physically and sexually abused by the adoptive father but the adoptive grandfather was just sexually and um yeah so my adoptive mom she was also a victim but she is a good one, you know. I had to oh. figure out in my, in my family, in the family that I was in, the adoptive family, who's good and who's not, you know. And so my adoptive maternal grandmother and my adoptive maternal aunt, both good ones, you know. Very, they kept me close to them. When my my, uh-huh. my grandma, my grandmother uh, did lots of training with me uh, on things. Um, I was slow I was like uh, sort of like autistic you know Um, but she helped me I don't know train it out of me I guess and get smart in a way and then also school the schoolhouse you know going to school was like um, at first I didn't like it you know because I was behind and and things like that but I I had some good um, special ed type teachers the first couple of years of school and I got really smart by about third grade and so then it was like school was my haven and that that was where I excelled and it was also a safe place you know a safe place for you sure now yeah. while you're going through this time period I would assume your stepfather is continue or excuse me adopted father in this case <laughs> we call him stepfather. <laughs> yeah. <whatever. laughs> was still being abusive. Is that correct? Oh yeah, he was. He was abusive to me even into my first marriage, even into my twenties. Yeah, this, 
ritual abuse stuff is real. Being trafficked is real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he he passed me around to his friends, take me to sex parties, you know, drug me. I was drugged most of the time. So, um, and then the grandpa Al, I remember that's the adoptive paternal grand, grandpa. He he was he was like a pillar in his community, you know, in his church. And there there is a church involved with this. There that are still, um, I believe, still. I can't prove it, but I believe still doing the satanic ritual abuse stuff. So as you so. grow up and, and, and continued on with this horrifying you know, a lifestyle, as far as I'm concerned, was the state involved uh, at any time? Mm -mm. No, no, because I was, I, I never even, I never even said anything. My mom would ask me over and over again because somebody, one of my friends saw him being inappropriate with me and kissing me on the mouth and stuff. And so mm -hmm. she told her mother, who then talked with my mother about it. And so my mother, after that, see, I was 12 by that time, and, and she kept asking me, did he do this? Did he do this? Did he do this? And I kept telling her, no, Mom, no, Mom. And that's because I was um, hypnotized to not say anything. Um, so. so you were basically under the influence the psychological influence that this this really right. wasn't happening and, and if you were asked any questions naturally it would be no no everything's yeah. fine that, yeah. that's and I was very I was a very good actress that's what I call it because uh, you know I was one of those kids first of all I'm doing really good in school now I'm getting you know uh, good grades and uh, I was compliant you know that was one of the programs of being very compliant and very quiet very introverted so you know most people thought there's nothing wrong you know and in those days too they didn't rush off to therapy like they do now you know so. well yeah things have really changed in the last few years well oh, tell yeah. me now, as this goes on and, and I would imagine it was a dark time in your life what right. kind of attitude did you have towards your your offenders in this in this particular case? What did well, you have? Well, I had I had a Stockholm syndrome. So I don't know if you know what that is. It's a psychological study that was done, but basically it's it's kind of like where you just become you become like um, like you sort of like your. Um, captors in a way or, or you feel sorry for them I, I felt sorry for them and and like um, Tom the adoptive pig like I call him he he would abuse me and then afterwards cry and and say you know why do you make me do this to you and I'm just a little kid at the time and I, of course I it's not my fault you know well <laughs> heaven's just no. not taking accountability <laughs> no no at all so we could kind of we could kind of put him in a boat of being a pedophile could we not uh, classify him in that direction oh my god yeah i think pedophile is a gentle term for him but um you know like there what's weird is like i would i couldn't tell the difference between him and dan Aykroyd. i he had mob connections and he he was like untouchable in a way in his community too so mm -hmm. um yeah so he just did what he wanted to and i remember uh, how uh, when I was younger, him and this perverted pedophile teacher that used to work at the Yelm High School had river property together in what's considered Yelm. And I live currently in Pierce County, but it butts right up against, I'm like on the border between Pierce and Thurston, so I'm in Roy. But I'm out here cleaning up his mess, basically. I never forgot what he said. And um, oh. it's been... It's been, that's another st part of the story, but it's it's been, that's what I've been doing out here, kind of on shit detail. Just just kind of cleaning up behind and trying to make things right. right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And we are moving in a good direction, so that's good. Well, that's wonderful. What do you do now for uh, a living? Are you, uh, what kind of career are you in now? Well, oddly enough, like licensed mental health counselor, so I do that. And I also do um, some energy healing work and some spiritual counseling, 
currently, and that that has kind of evolved. My practice has 